All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our weekly EKG series. Uh, once more, I'm uh, John Felt, and I'm joined here today by Dr. Uh, Stuart Covey, uh, one of our mm -hmm. pediatric cardiologists. Thanks um, for having me. We are grateful to have him here, and we have a great uh, presentation today. So we'll jump right into the case, as always. Uh, this was a three-year-old male that presented to the emergency department with a chief complaint of vomiting. Uh, was initially noted right away uh, to have uh, abnormal vital signs. The patient was uh, extremely tachycardic with a heart rate measured at 300. Respiratory rate was also elevated at 80. Uh, he had a stable blood pressure and a good oxygen saturation on room air. Uh, by exam, uh, again, his exam more or less matched the vital signs. He was in some respiratory distress, uh, some mild retractions and increased work of breathing, and then a pretty impressive cardiac exam with a prominent tachycardia, which uh, seemed irregular. Uh, to the practitioner. Uh, so an EKG was obtained and uh, this is what we see. All right. Well, thanks, John. So, you know, the first thing we think about as is, is cardiology uh, doctors when we see or get called about an EKG of this nature, um, besides the basics of is the patient conscious, awake, or are they um, um, not responsive? So stable versus unstable. Exactly. Um, is to pretty much assess you know the the nature of the QRS and that generally speaking can help you quite a bit uh, you know a narrow complex QRS um, in general um, can definitely have symptoms can have poor cardiac output but um, actually being um, you know pulseless um, or um, unconscious or having a syncopal event those things one tends to be uh, in their mind more associated with a, a ventricular tachycardia or ventricular arrhythmia um, again that is um, not always the case, but that's just a general concept to think about. Um, so this patient came in, this is the uh, initial EKG uh, that was obtained in the ER. Um, so, so looking at this EKG, the first thing you're, you're going to see across the board is you know, the fast rate. Um, of course, you know, as John just mentioned, the rate was 300 beats per minute. Um, and the next thing you're going to be looking at is, in general across the board here, um, looking at all these QRSs and, and in general to see if they're a narrow or a wide QRS. You know, in, in this patient, um, even if you don't know much about EKGs, you can really tell at a glance that it's a narrow QRS. Um, and the other thing you can tell pretty, pretty well is that it's, it's a quite, quite regular, um, meaning that you um, have a very stable rate and that it's not very much. Um, in some patients, you get a variation in the rate, a sinus arrhythmia, as they call that. Um, and, you know, the fact that this is almost mechanically going at 300 beats a minute without any variation, um, in addition to the rate being 300, are, are items that should alert you that perhaps this is more of an, a true uh, arrhythmia or an SVT type of arrhythmia rather than a, a sinus tachycardia or something of that nature. Um, I wanted to just briefly go down here to um, a differential diagnosis slide here, and I think this is helpful to, to basically show you... Um, differential diagnosis for, I believe this is tachycardia overall. Um, so from a cardiac standpoint, like we were discussing, narrow and regular, as we have here, um, you can see that sinus tachycardia tops the list. So, you know, your first thing you want to think about, is it just a sinus tachycardia? And it, it, if it is just a sinus tachycardia, and that's when you kind of jump over here to all these different categories. Is it a tachycardia that's associated or secondary to any of these factors? Infection with fever, endocrine, hemonc, uh, like anemia, um, and a high cardiac output state, toxins, or just stress and emotion anxiety. Which um, we see a lot of with these kids. Exactly. So, and that's not to say that it's, it's, it's always good to have, be very consci conscientious and think about, you know, an arrhythmia. Um, but at 300 beats a minute, that is abnormal, you know. So none of these conditions uh, in reality should be causing a heart rate that high um, in general. Um, the other things we think about are atrial flutter with flutter waves, and uh, obviously the, those waves are still going down the AV nodes, so you have a narrow QRS. Um, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which we can discuss later. Um, AVRT, which is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, which you commonly have heard of is probably Wolf Parkinson White, meaning you see some evidence of pre-excitation at baseline, um, and then you have a, re a macro reentry circuit that's not just within the AV node, but actually macro. Um, atrial tachycardia itself, uh, which is, you know, a similar concept to sinus tech in that it's coming from the atrium, but it's not coming from the sinus node. Um, junctional tachycardia, which is coming from the AV junction and therefore going down the his Purkinje system, and it's narrow. Um, so these are kind of the broad category, and this is how I try to think about it when I, I hear about a patient like this. Um, if you're getting into narrow and irregular, which is clearly not our patient as we just saw, um, you start to think about the AFib. Um, 
premature uh, atrial contractions or complexes with uh, aberrancy or something of that nature can also create a different QRS. But um, those PACs are not coming in regularly, and that's why it's irregular. Um, atrial flutter with a variable conduction or variable block and then the other two, uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia and sinus arrhythmia, um, again. So so we'll go back to our initial EKG here. And I think that the important factors we discussed, the um, the rate, the narrow complex uh, QRS here, as you can see. Oh, sorry. The, um, here we go. So the QRS, you can always measure at each box. It, you know, of course, is 40 milliseconds, and you can actually measure that out or 0.04 seconds. Um, but it looks narrow is, is the gist of it, and you can tell that it's not a wide complex tachycardia. You can tell that it's regular. So you've already eliminated some things from your mind, um, atrial flutter, AFib. Uh -huh. um, the next thing to, to consider here is um, basically uh, what I like to look for are P waves. So I think P waves are a good theme and something to always look for. And P waves are telling you basically when the uh, atrium is being depolarized. And, and the question is, when did the P waves come in? Do you see the P waves? Um, if, if it's an atrial tachycardia, um, if it's a sinus tachycardia, you're more likely to see P waves. And um, certain types of these reentry pathways, you can see P waves as well. So what I wanted to point out on this specific EKG for this patient is um, particularly you can see it and start to see it in lead V5. That's not always the case here. So this is lead V5. Um, usually lead 2 can be a good lead as well, and sometimes you can see it. Um, if you zoom in really closely here, you can see what appears to be P waves after a T wave. Again, what you're really seeing is uh, T waves that just don't look quite regular all the time. So marching along, for example, here with lead V5, you see a T wave, a little bit different appearance of a T wave, and then here it just looks like it's almost biphasic or just something not quite right. Uh -huh. um, so the question becomes is, is this the normal um, T wave for this patient, and, uh, or is there a P wave buried in it? This one looks a little bit more peaked, so is there a T wave, uh, P wave in that T, a Mayan temple sort of thing as it's been described? And then further on here, is this P wave um, just slightly staggered from the T wave, given it this almost biphasic or just not normal appearance? Um, so that's how I sort of tend to look at these sort of EKGs. You try to look for the P wave if you can find it. Now, um, if you can find a P wave, that can help you start to narrow down your differential diagnosis. Um, a P wave in and of itself, if, if you want to become a little bit more um, academic about looking into it and narrowing your diagnosis down, you can look at the, see where the P wave is. And if you take a, a measurement of your R to R interval, so here to here, you can grossly make an assessment of this P wave. Um, so if you determine that the P wave is the second hump here, uh, which, again, this complex here, the second hump there, you, you could say that this P wave is coming probably around the midway or even uh, more than midway um, between the, the R to R interval right here. So, you know, you could say that your P um, is greater than one half your R to R. So in that case, what we would call that is, in cardiology, is a long RP. Um, this is a, you know, kind of like when you categorize things into narrow versus wide QRS or regular versus irregular, this is kind of another way to, a nice dichotomy to, to put it into one, one category or another, um, long RP versus a short RP. And the short RP would occur in the first half. In the first half, exactly. Okay. So, and, and sometimes it's subjective, and sometimes it is hard to differentiate what truly is the T wave and the P wave. Yeah. So to do that, sometimes you have to go back to the patient's normal tracing, and you need to see, you know, what does their normal T wave look like? You know, is their normal T wave like that? Um, and then you can also look at their P wave, of course, as well. And if they're similar, you're, you know, you might have your hands tied. But usually there's some sort of difference between the two. Okay. And if you can tell the difference in their um, overall morphology, you can kind of assess if you have a normal baseline, which you don't always have with these patients, you can compare the two. Um, so suffice it to say that if you can identify what you think is a P wave and it's uh, greater than halfway from the R to R, like we showed here, then you could say it's a long RP. Otherwise, it's a short RP. And why does that matter? Let me pull up here. So the RP relationship here um, can be quite useful. Change your color. Thank you. Do it in a nice red color. Um, so this is a brief list, and this is not all inclusive. But if you have a short RP, 
it can help categorize things. So a typical AVN RT, meaning that, and when it says short RP, it means that after the QRS, the P wave is coming in relatively quickly. So what you're gonna basically have in a typical AV node is everything's gonna come down the slow pathway, so that if this is your quote unquote AV node, you're getting this slow downward and this fast upward. And what this basically means is, if you can think about the Hisper-Kinji system going down to your ventricles, is essentially that your QRS is occurring, as we saw, and the short P is coming relatively quickly after that, and then you have your T wave. Hmm. So this P wave, and here it's retrograde, of course, not always the case, but in here it's retrograde. So what you're seeing basically from the AV node is you get conduction down, the slow pathway right here, and that's giving you um, conduction to your ventricle, which goes down your Hisperkinji, and with this depolarization of the ventricle, you get the QRS right here. Uh -huh. Now, as this circuit is going, because mind you, this AV nodal circuit is going, you know, continuously, and basically occasionally there's uh, escape up here, escape down here, and that's what's causing your, your P waves, which can be retrograde, and when it escapes down to the ventricle, that's causing your QRS, okay? So essentially think about it in the regard that it's going down the slow, up the fast, and that's why you quickly will see this P wave, as I identified here, right after the QRS, okay? So I think that's enough about that for now, but getting the concept of, of where the P wave falls is important. Um, AVRT, atrioventricular uh, reentrant tachycardia, um, can actually be both um, short and, in theory, it could also be a long RP. And that just depends on, just uh, draw it over here, I guess. Um, that would depend on your, let's draw a quick card here. I'll draw your SA node and your AV node here, your conduction down. That would depend on how fast your circuit that's going retrograde is conducting. Okay. So if you have your retrograde circuit here coming back up, and it doesn't have to go to your SA node, but that's just showing you an example here. And you have your conduction coming down here, and it's going down the normal pathway, as we see in a narrow complex um, AVRT, which we call orthodromic, which is what you can see in patients with WPW. Um, it then comes up this accessory pathway, and if this accessory pathway is conducting quickly, or relatively quickly, then you can get this short RP tachycardia, where you see a retrograde P wave. However, if this is a slower pathway, so you can you know, imagine it being kind of squiggly, if that's how you think about slow, um, or slower retrograde, then you can have that P wave basically come later. Got okay. it. So, so far in our example, um, we really we, we thought we saw that the P wave was greater than one half of the R to R, so we'd call that an, a long RP. So in our minds already, we can start to think about um, either AVRT of either category, or we can also think about things like atrial tachycardia. So um, essentially, you're just getting a normal QRS, and then eventually your P wave is coming back in from your normal sinus node. Um, other categories, which we I don't think we'll delve into right now, would be atypical AVNRT. Um, so in, uh, instead of having that slow fast, you can have um, a slow slow, or you could have a fast slow. So just different combinations of um, how these different things are arranged. So if you have a, um, this is your AV node again, if you have a uh, fast down and then slow up, um, or slow and slow. Got it. Okay. And then the other ones, again, which are a, a bit more in depth are, are the PJRTs, which is more of a, a permanent junctional reciprocating tachycardia, which is a lot like an AVRT, which we won't talk about right now. Um, so anyway, so with this patient, we thought we saw a, a long RP. And this patient in particular, now John, I'm not sure if you want to talk about the, briefly what they did for the patient or if you wanted me to continue. Um, so, you know, at this point, you know, the patient was deemed to be in a stable um, supraventricular tachycardia here. So um, based on following the PALS algorithm, they initially tried vagal maneuvers, which were unsuccessful, um, but in that time were able to get IV access and then provided uh, adenosine. Uh, the initial uh, attempt at 0.1 milligram per kilo, which is how, what PALS recommends, was unsuccessful. So then um, they doubled that to 0.2 per kilo, and he was able to be converted into a regular rhythm based on that. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, 
So exactly, and that's and that's the way to do it, really. I mean, you assess the situation, um, and this is more of an EKG interpretation discussion, so I won't go into the management too much, but um, if a patient's stable, adenosine's the right choice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, realistically, what you are doing with adenosine, um, as we're all relatively familiar with, is you're, you're, you're basically transiently blocking the AV node, and... Um, you know, the goal of that is basically to see what happens when you block the AV node and to see if um, you can break the rhythm is the first and foremost. Um, you can get diagnostic information as well, as we all know. Um, but you want to see basically with the AV node, uh, w- with an agent that blocks the AV node, does the um, arrhythmia terminate? And, and as John mentioned, with the second dose, which is sometimes required for multiple reasons, um, whether it's the infusion wasn't um, given rapidly enough of the initial dose, or the fact that there it just wasn't a high enough dose for the patient. Um, this patient clearly broke with the second slightly higher dose for whatever reason. And this second EKG here we have is uh, basically the patient right here, um, back to their uh, normal sinus rhythm. And um, I think oftentimes when you see a patient that breaks um, in the ER, it's always, in, I mean, you're always happy the patient's out of the SVT, and that's fantastic, and that's great, and you've done your job. But you have to also think about getting a tracing while it's occurring to see how it breaks. Um, and that's to help later diagnose what it was when the EP doctor talks with them or the general cardiologist. So you're saying we need to ma- help make your job easier. Exactly. All right. Yeah, All right. It, make, it makes it easier. It, it also can affect, you know, whether or not the kid, um, you know, even needs an EP study or not. Right. Um, it, it, can, it can make a difference. Um, not that you want to go doing EP studies in, in newborns, um, you know, obviously, but... Um, it can make it make a fairly big difference. So for this patient, they were able to show just the baseline EKG. And another important thing to point on 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 this EKG right here um, is basically at baseline, you can see that, and this is real life. This is not the perfect example. You can see that there's a you know you're looking at lead two here, for example. You can see P waves and QRS and a T, and you just march that along P QRS T. Occasionally, you're going to have even in a, a patient that you have no clear reason to have this, you can have little uh, blips or artifact, or uh, as some people call it, glitches artifactus. Basically, you're seeing these little little blips that are just kind of between the T and the P wave here, and um, they're difficult because you can overinterpret them and say, is there some sort of atrial ectopic beats coming in randomly there and there, or is it just, you know, uh, the the sensitivity of the EKG leads picking up electrical activity. It's it's difficult to know, um, and whether or not it's 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 regular. Um, you know, in a patient, for example, that you have um, concern if they actually have a VT and you see waves just going like this, or a V fib, or you know, so that would be maybe like a, a polymorphic VT or something. Is it someone that's simply just getting you know chest PT or something like that and it's episodic because they're getting episodic chest PT so you know in this patient it's it's a little bit difficult um, at baseline because you're seeing these again like I circled these little little blips here and then even here you know as you move along and lead to you see these little um, even the T wave here has some in it and it's something that you need to take into consideration and oftentimes it's artifact but you you don't want to ignore it necessarily um, a baby will be moving more often, especially their limb leads, so you may get more artifact in the limb leads. Um, so we discussed that patient you know, in fairly good detail. Um, I'm going to see if John wanted to say anything else before I show you kind of a more classic example of a, an AVRT. No, let's go ahead with this. Okay. Um, so essentially what I wanted to show you here, um, and this again comes back to the categorizing things by narrow complex, um, looking at the RP, whether it's short or long, and um, also the importance of showing when the SVT breaks what sort of um, pattern emerges or what you see. So in this patient, um, we see a narrow complex uh, SVT. And you know, ballparking the, the rate itself, we see that it's about one big box, which is we've all relatively hopefully learned. It's in the high 200s or around 300 beats a minute. So we see a narrow complex tachycardia, we'll just say around 300 beats per minute. And we also see here that um, if you look very carefully in certain leads, we'll try to find a good one for you. And I believe it's here, lead two, you can see some, uh, you see your P, your QRS, and you see a T wave. What you see here as well, and again, this is subject to interpretation, and there's some better examples that are better than others, but this appears to be a retrograde P wave here. Appears to be. 
and you go further on here and you can kind of see something here looks again like this uh, retrograde P wave and then even here a little bit you know in, in a perfectly normal patient you really shouldn't see anything that blips down there it should return to baseline and uh, remain isoelectric until you get to your T wave so that's one thing just to notice and that's a clue and you can say I'm not sure if that's a P wave or not and that's fine it may or may not be but in this patient you know clearly they provided this patient with adenosine um, in the middle of this tracing here and what we basically see is, sorry, what we expect to see with adenosine, which is you have, and we'll go down to lead two here because I think that's a good lead. You can see your, uh, your QRS here, a T wave, QRS, a T wave, and then really you're just pretty much getting a block. Nice pause. Yeah. Nice pause. And you can measure out the time frame, but you know it's it's trans it's it's relatively short lived, and this is just showing that you are blocking the AV node. Okay, um, and that's what adenosine does, of course, and that's that's the point of adenosine. You're you're basically trying to to take this AV node, and whether your rhythm is AV nodal reentry, or whether your rhythm simply comes down the AV node and then up an accessory pathway here. What you're essentially trying to do is temporarily halt this. And by doing that, trying to reset and allow your normal sinus to kick back in and conduct normally. Mm. And hopefully at that point, it won't be able to con uh, conduct retrograde. It can, it may, and that's the reason why some of these patients go right back into the SVT. Um, just because you break this um, arrhythmia at the uh, AV node, but right away this retrograde pathway is capable of conducting um, retrograde and you go back into this cyclic AVRT. Um, or the same concept with the AV nodal where you're transiently blocking one of these limbs and trying to establish normal sinus rhythm. In this patient what we see is this block, a nice little pause as John mentioned, and then you basically, over time, see this kick in, which, again, if you can't see a clear P wave right before it in a nice PR interval, it could be a junctional escape beat as everything's starting to wake up again. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that there's a P wave and it's conducted, but you can't see it very clearly. Flex beat kick in. And then by the next, next point, you start to see, again, what looks like another QRS. And if you follow this out, in theory, hopefully, you get back to a nice normal sinus rhythm, but it takes a while to kick back in. Right. Um, the other thing to point out on this patient is actually when their sinus starts to kick back in a little bit further down the road, and this is where it's important to have this tracing of when the patient breaks in their baseline, is you can see a QRS that appears to be different in morphology um, than our previous one, which was over here. So just at a glance, you can tell that it's... Wide at the base. Wider, exactly. It's, it's not necessarily diffusely wide. It's not a major wide complex the whole entire way through, but the early part that leads into it right here is wide, and then it goes into a QRS that starts to look a bit normal, um, but not completely. Right. You know, and what this is in this case is what we call a delta wave. And basically a delta wave is, is you know, the, the, the wording that we use to, when we visually see pre-excitation in a patient with WPW. And what you're seeing here is um, the accessory pathway is um, conducting somewhat, and you're also conduct, and that is pre-exciting the ventricle, and you're also seeing still some conduction down the normal AV node, so it's not an all-or-none phenomenon, which is what a lot of people believe, but the important part is there's pre-excitation of the ventricle, which gives you a short PR, which if you could actually find the P wave and you think that's it and measure it here, that would be shorter than your baseline PR, okay? And that, again, is indicating to you that you have pre-excitation, you have this wide complex, uh, or wider complex, yet when you go into the arrhythmia, as we saw previously, it's narrow complex. So clearly, it's going down the normal AV node. Actually, I'll show you over here. Clearly, if you take this heart diagram, 
this rhythm was going through the AV node in a normal conduction system, okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was causing a narrow QRS during the tachycardia itself, as we saw over here. Um, when it goes back up, conducting retrograde, that's when it creates that substrate free arrhythmia and the SVT. Um, so that's how we know that at baseline there's pre-excitation. We see that in the SVT it's narrow complex, so we can say that this was what we call orthodromic AVRT versus antidromic, which is another type of um, atrioventricular engine tachycardia where it actually is going down the accessory and then back up the AV node. And the reason why in uh, um, that sort of uh, um, antidromic AVRT can be scary or tricky is because it's wide complex. Right, yeah. So these are the wide complex ones, which you're not sure if they are uh, SVT with aberrancy, whether it's VT, right. whether it's uh, you know exa this example here, um, antidromic AVRT. Um, so anyways, that's just briefly a basic uh, overview of um, AVRT um, and this patient example. Um, trying to see if there's anything else. Um, the last thing I was going to touch on was basically um, a nice way to categorize for you. Now that we've talked about and drawn some pictures here, um, just kind of as a summary, um, the three different types of SVT um, and how you as an emergency department physician can basically categorize it in your mind. Um, one being the AVRT, as we discussed, atrioventricular range and tachycardia, AVNRT, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and ectopic. With, in general, especially in young children or neonates, this being the number one diagnosis by far, various studies showing it could be around 80% even. Wow. Um, AVNRT becoming more prevalent as you age. Um, you know, still AVRT uh, does stay number one for quite a bit, and it depends on what study you read. But AVNRT generally is number two early on, but in adolescence it can come close to the frequency of AVRT, um, and ectopic being much less frequent than the other two. Um, the important reason to know these uh, three different categories is, as you can see from these nice diagrams, truly the involvement of the AV node will affect your management and whether you expect to see any change with adenosine. Right. With the AVRT, you see that the AV node, uh, this is a much better diagram than I drew, but you can see that the AV node right here uh, is involved in the circuit right here. Therefore, if you block that with adenosine, you have a chance to stop this. And then here again, I think they're, they're trying to show here the um, pathway and the QRS there um, looks like that's probably actually going in the orthodromic tachycardia during this actual tachycardia. Um, here we're seeing an AV nodal reentry tachycardia like we've already demonstrated. And here again, quite obviously, if you block the AV node, you can break it as well. Um, and this is, again, a nice little insert showing you the fast and slow pathways and how they relate and how the beats escape going up or down to the um, ventricle or the atrium and depolarize it accordingly. And then ectopic, <clears throat> which, again, this is important because there is um, an ectopic focus that is firing, and that's more of a, what we call automaticity rather than a re-entry. So, again, this may not be something that anyone is ever asked to describe in much detail, but the, mechanism, the mechanism of ectopic being automaticity versus the other two, which is re-entry, is relevant. And in this ectopic, as you can see, when you give adenosine and you stop this AV node, you're not going to do anything. Yeah, you, you, may, you may transiently block, or you will transiently block, any conduction down the Hisperkinji system. But again, what you, what you haven't done is you haven't put a roadblock in any sort of reentry circuit at all. Um, and therefore, this focus is still irritable. It's still angry. And these are the kids that are post-operative. These are the kids that have cardiomyopathies and just abnormal atrial or ventricular myocardium, depending on your arrhythmia. And that's just a whole different category altogether. The only other thing to point out for ectopic is, and this is something, again, that you may or may not retain, but it's good to know, is that they estimate that around 20% of ectopic tachycardias actually do have um, cyclic AMP-sensitive uh, receptors, I believe. And that basically means that with adenosine, you could actually theoretically stop an ectopic atrial tachycardia um, in 20% of cases. Okay. So if a patient is stable, 
even if some smarty pants thinks they see it and they say it's ectopic atrial for whatever reason or they know the kid's history it's still worth giving a try it, it still is worth probably giving a try if you're smart and um, you have time on your side and the patient is stable um, again the success rate may not be high but uh, again it only takes a few minutes to draw it up um, if you already have IV access and to administer it quickly um, so just that was just a brief overview of the different types you know of course what do these categories of SVT not include? Well, really, and these are things you definitely have seen or will see, um, it doesn't include flutter, atrial flutter, and it doesn't include atrial fibrillation. Now, if this is a, um, if you are a physician that is focused on pediatrics, you know, of these two, of course, this is the one you're going to see much more frequently, um, atrial flutter. Um, this technically is considered to be, these days, a re-entry sort of circuit in a, in a way. It's a, a micro re-entry within the atrium, so um, in a way, atrial flutter is uh, a re-entry. And atrial fibrillation, again, is something that is uh, more common in the adult population, which, you know, we're not talking about much in this discussion. But atrial fibrillation can be seen in all sorts of patients, and we definitely see this a lot. Um, if you're an adult provider, you will see um, these sorts of rhythms right. in our adult congenital heart disease patients. Um, which can be very tricky to break um, and may require multiple medications, overdrive pacing, or, you know, even synchronized cardioversion. Okay. So. But topic for another day. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, appreciate uh, this overview and summary. So as we're talking about these types of SVT, um, obviously the most important thing is the ability to identify a P wave and then to be able to see what the morphology of that P wave is. So um, mm -hmm. as you helpfully pointed out, this idea of an RP uh, interval and using that to help classify what type of arrhythmia you may be dealing with is, I think, a very helpful and useful tool. Uh, as long as we can kind of sift through the artifact, that's obviously going to be um, generally a problem with our young pediatric patients. Um, also, once again, you know, we see the important role of adenosine, uh, both as a therapeutic and as well as a diagnostic tool. And then I think the important point of making sure that we're gathering um, accurate and good information with the EKG that we're taking both a pre um, as well as a during the administration of the adenosine to see what happens as the, the heart starts back up again as well as then a baseline uh, if we can uh, so that our uh, colleagues have all of that information at their fingertips when eventually uh, helping to make that final disposition for the patient uh, in the outpatient world. So. Stu, thank you. Yeah, thank Appreciate you very it. much. That was good. Thank you.